As we conclude this in-depth examination of Bob Duco's fulfilled prophecies in the New Testament as proof that the Bible is true, we can be forgiven if we've been intentionally led down a rather well-groomed garden path. It may not be Duco's fault for posting all the signs to this path, as he merely has been repeating what has been fed to him by generations of other such apologists. But perhaps what modern evangelical apologists like Duco consider fulfilled prophecy really wasn't considered as such by the authors of our New Testament documents. Maybe if we take another look at these so-called fulfilled prophecies from the perspective of the authors, we can find out why passages quoted only partially and seemingly out of context, like Zechariah 9.9 explored in episode 31 regarding Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, were nonetheless used by authors otherwise well-versed in the ancient Hebrew scriptures. Joel Hoffman, an American scholar who has served on the faculties of Brandeis University in Boston and at Hebrew Union College in New York City, has offered in his book, The Bible Doesn't Say That, a possible explanation regarding the use of the ancient texts by the New Testament authors. These authors didn't find verses that they believed were literally prophetic descriptions of what they'd experienced or heard had been experienced by others with regards to events in Jesus' life. The verses instead gave context to that experience. So, as Hoffman notes, our English translation of the phrase, this was to fulfill scripture, often found in the gospel narratives, is, in fact, an unfortunate translation. He explains, A proof text is a text that is used to demonstrate a point. This isn't proof in the modern scientific sense, though. The proof text doesn't have to prove anything. And the proof text doesn't even have to mean the same thing as what it's demonstrating. The point of using a proof text was that it was considered better to use words of Scripture than to invent new ones, even if the words of Scripture were taken out of context. So, better translations might be, this matches Scripture, or this accords with Scripture, or even this complements Scripture. More generally, we see that one common style in the New Testament is to refer back to the text of the Old Testament, matching words or phrases not for their truth value, but for their rhetorical impact. Once you start looking for it, you'll see it all over. Using Hoffman's suggestion, see how his proposed translations might work with the following passage. In the Gospel of John, the author notes that even after many miracles had been performed, Jews were still unpersuaded that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. The author then states, This matches the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We can see this more forcefully when we see how the author of Matthew uses this technique in his rewrite of Mark. In Mark 1, verses 32 through 34, is a story about how Jesus healed those in a town of Galilee of their ailments and demon possessions. When Matthew copied Mark's story, he added a verse reflecting a verse from Isaiah. Most English translations have this verse state, this was to fulfill. But understanding the technique from Hoffman's instruction, it would probably better read, this complements what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. So these New Testament passages don't necessarily mean that prophecy, as a prediction of a future event, is what is being fulfilled. Statements like these are matches between the gospel stories and the more established Hebrew texts made in order to persuade those hearing this new story of Jesus that he stood in an older tradition. Think of it as literary artistry. If we compare the scene of Jesus being offered drink while affixed to the cross in both the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, it's easy to see that Matthew has taken Mark's rather bland, then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and made a more direct parallel with the Septuagint version of Psalm 69, which Duco quotes as fulfilled prophecy. Matthew writes that Jesus was given wine to drink mixed with gall. And some assume this is a contradiction between the two accounts, the one in Mark and the other in Matthew. Instead, what Matthew is doing is taking Mark's story and making a far more direct quotation of the psalm as a sort of repeat performance or echo of a detail mentioned in the more ancient text. 
In some passages, the readers are directed explicitly to the reference being made, as occurs in Matthew 8.17, while in others, it is not, as in Matthew 27.34. Nevertheless, the purpose is the same. It's an attempt to give rhetorical weight to the topic of the Gospels, namely that Jesus was the Messiah, rooted in Jewish tradition. And this may help explain, at least in part, why so few Jews were persuaded by the use of such proof texts in the New Testament literature. They weren't swayed by the rhetorical point. But those not familiar with this technique may have misunderstood the use of the ancient texts and indeed been fooled into thinking that literal prophecies had been fulfilled. While Hoffman helps us understand these so-called fulfilled prophecies in a Jewish exegetical context, we have to remember what brought us here. We've been examining all of Duco's claimed examples of fulfilled prophecy in the spirit of how he appears to intend them, as ancient glimpses into the future. In other words, we've been operating under the modern definition and understanding of the word prophecy as communications by God through a prophet a prediction of something to come in the future that the prophet could not have known in any ordinary way. This is why Duco and other apologists like him view prophecy as proof that the Bible was not only written under divine influence by an entity unrestricted by the constraints of time and space, but is also 100% true. How could someone hundreds of years prior to an event have knowledge of that event unless that knowledge was given to them by someone standing outside space and time, namely God. But did you notice a pattern with nearly all of these so-called prophecies? They are not packaged in a single book or chapter of the Hebrew Bible as you find with other clearly defined prophecies found in the biblical texts. No, these so-called prophecies concerning Jesus are found in bits and pieces a verse here, a verse there, a set of verses here, a set of verses there, all cobbled together from diverse sources and genres. This is why Hoffman's explanation of these fulfilled prophecies as examples of Jewish exegesis works so perfectly well in understanding these passages in their New Testament contexts and why they seem to fail so miserably as Old Testament glimpses into Jesus' future in the New Testament. It's because nuggets of prophecy dribbled here and there throughout diverse genres in the biblical text is not how typical biblical prophecy works. Biblical prophecy is usually very clear, detailing names, places, and events to occur in the future. Consider the following. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. From the north I am going to bring against Tyre Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, with horsemen, and a great army. He will ravage your settlements on the mainland with a sword. He will set up siege works against you, build a ramp up your walls, and raise his shields against you. Now contrast this clear prophecy concerning the future of Tyre and Ezekiel with a song lyric from the Psalms. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Where is the prophecy? Who is this about? The song does not say. Where is this occurring? The song does not say. When are these events occurring? The song does not say. And why not? Because it's not prophecy. Psalm 22 is a song of lament. Now, have the Christian apologist find a single example of an unequivocal biblical prophecy that has to be cobbled together from sources like Micah, Isaiah, Malachi, Psalms, Amos, Joel, Jeremiah, and Zechariah, or any other number of diverse biblical books. They won't be able to do so, because that is not how biblical prophecy works. If we're going to follow Duco's lead and believe these passages are to be understood as so-called prophecies concerning Jesus, 
They look not like true biblical prophecy, but as if someone went back into the Hebrew Bible to deliberately pull together these verses, call them prophecies, and apply them to Jesus, whether they actually apply to the historical Jesus or not, in order to legitimize their version of Jesus as the Messiah after he had been rejected as such by those who really knew the stories best. And that is, in the tradition of Jewish exegesis, exactly what happened. And the New Testament itself provides us this explanation. As noted in episode 41 regarding the 53rd chapter of Isaiah and the so-called suffering servant, the authors of the Gospels do not recount anyone in the lifetime of Jesus nor of Jesus himself making explicit connection between Jesus and Isaiah 53, especially as a prophecy. The only ones making connections of any kind between Jesus and the fractured verse references from the Hebrew Bible are the authors of the New Testament texts themselves, or on occasion, Jesus, through dialogues written by these same authors. The author of Luke explains this extraordinary oddity, if we are to believe that Jesus oozes from the Old Testament texts in prophecy after prophecy from Genesis through Joshua through Psalms and Isaiah, Jonah, and Malachi, that no one recognized who Jesus really was and what his mission was all about in his appearance stories found in his gospel. After he had risen from the dead, Jesus made his first post-resurrection appearance to two of his followers on the road to Emmaus. Neither man recognized the risen Jesus as they walked along and talked together. The men told Jesus about recent events and were astonished when this stranger seemed to be unaware of what had happened. When they came to the story of the women finding the empty tomb, Jesus stopped them and said, How foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. When all three men finally reached the home to where the two were going, they urged Jesus to stay with them. And when Jesus broke bread at their table, they suddenly recognized who he was. But it was when Jesus was explaining to them on the road all that the scriptures had said concerning himself that the men first began to get their suspicions. They exclaimed, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Then, when Jesus makes his second appearance, this time to the remaining 11 inner circle of disciples in Jerusalem, in Luke 24, verses 36 through 49, he again is not recognized, even by his closest companions. They remain fearful and amazed, even when he shows them his pierced hands and feet. It is not until he explains that he fulfilled what was written about him in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, and opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures, that they finally understood. These are not historical events recorded by Luke in his gospel. These are metaphors invented by the author to explain to his audience that Jesus remains unrecognizable as the Jewish Messiah until he is fit into the ancient scriptures and makes his appearance through select verses. In other words, Jesus, in a manner, fulfills these diverse snippets in the ancient text by being read into and through them one illuminating the other, but not as the fulfillment of past prediction, as noted earlier, as a repeat performance, so that Jesus can be made by the gospel authors to stand in this more ancient Jewish tradition. And this sort of echoing of ancient texts by later authors isn't unique to the New Testament. Consider the Hebrew Bible's book, Song of Songs. Clearly, this is an old, sensual, often erotic love poem, it was probably sung at weddings to the doubtless blushing of those attending. The poem never mentions Yahweh and instead focuses completely on two very passionate lovers. But that didn't stop later Jewish interpreters as deciding the poem was really about the love of Yahweh for his bride, Israel, or Christians from interpreting it as about the love of God for his church. Song of Songs was written centuries before Jesus lived and his followers built gatherings to remember him and was never intended to be prophetic about God coming to love his church. But could Song of Songs be used as a metaphor for such thinking? Certainly, why not? If these ancient echoes from the text of the Hebrew Bible were meant to be predictions of Jesus' future, as Duco and his evangelical apologists assert, instead of examples of Jewish exegetical practices to try and keep Jesus in the tradition of these ancient and venerable texts, 
why is there not a single unambiguous prophecy found concerning the Messiah's resurrection? Go ahead, ask Duco or any other Christian apologist to find one. They won't be able to do it because no such prophecy exists. Duco tried, of course, as we examined in episode 39, but none of those verses Duco chose, even if they truly did reference resurrection, had anything whatsoever to do with the Messiah. And that is because there is no passage in the Hebrew Bible unambiguously about the Messiah that in any way speaks about resurrection. Not even the authors of the New Testament itself could find one to use even as an echo. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.4, where none other than the Apostle Paul does indeed try to claim that there are prophecies concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. What I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Most scholars consider verses 3 through 7 to actually predate Paul as probably one of the earliest creedal statements that Paul inherited. So this claim that Jesus fulfilled some sort of scriptural prophecy about dying and resurrecting in three days might be quite old. But notice, he does not cite a verse, a chapter, a book, or name any ancient prophet that actually supports the claim. The assertion is made, but there is nothing to back it up if it were indeed meant to be a proof text regarding an ancient prophecy. So it's rather obvious none of these so-called fulfilled prophecies from the Hebrew Scriptures really had Jesus in mind when written. The modern apologist, like Duco, has clearly misunderstood the use of Old Testament passages by New Testament authors as literal predictions of the future. The authors of our New Testament texts were merely standing in an already established tradition within Judaism, as demonstrated in examples we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Qumran sect, which produced these documents, too referred back to the Hebrew Scriptures and found in these more ancient texts passages they felt could help explain experiences within their own community. These references, as they do in the New Testament, did not take account of the full original contexts of these passages from which the verses were taken. The authors of these works found enough of a parallel between their own experiences, or at least their perceptions of their own experiences, and certain passages found in the Hebrew Scriptures to make a connection and legitimize their claim to be standing as the divinely authorized representatives of a tradition stretching to the beginning of time. It simply defies the imagination that it would not have been possible for prophets to have given clear prophecies that would have been unquestionably about Jesus and fully fulfilled by him if, indeed, their prophecies really were intended to be about Jesus, as the apologist claims. And such prophecy is not without precedent. 1 Kings 13.2 is said to record a prophecy that a future king of Judah, specifically and unequivocally named in the text, as Josiah. It was foretold in the text that he would take the bones of all the priests of the high places of Israel's King Jeroboam and burn them on Jeroboam's altar. Then, in 2 Kings 23, 15 through 18, this event occurred exactly as prophesied, some 300 years after the prophecy was recorded. Of course, we can argue about whether or not the so-called prophecy was actually written after the fact and then interpolated into the text of 1 Kings to appear as a prophecy, but that isn't the point here. The point is that the biblical prophecy of 1 Kings 13 is incredibly specific and is fulfilled to the letter in 2 Kings 23. For those who claim the Bible is the inerrant word of God and that the prophecy of 1 Kings is genuine, the template then had been set, and prophecies concerning Jesus could have, and we might say should have been, equally as specific and precisely fulfilled. As we've seen in this series, however, nothing could be further from the truth regarding these so-called messianic prophecies of Christ. Then there's prophecies like that found in Daniel 8. Here, what seems like a cryptic, esoteric, and indiscernible vision of the future is given to the prophet, but then the symbolism is fully explained in plain, easy-to-understand everyday language, so that no mistake can be made as to what the prophecy is concerning. Again, an argument can be made that the so-called prophecy vision was written after the historical fact, but again, that isn't the point. For those who claim the Bible is the inerrant word of God and that the prophecy of Daniel 8 is a genuine description of a future event, then a different template could have been used for the prophecies concerning Jesus, which could have been, and some might argue should have been, 
equally as easily explained so that no doubt could have been left over their exact meaning. But this isn't what we find. What we find, if we approach the text in the way the apologists like Duco want us to approach the text, as reading about glimpses from the Hebrew scriptures regarding the future life of Jesus, are instead vague, out of context, so-called prophecies cherry-picked and often altered to apply to Jesus. But unfortunately, for those who actually value the biblical text and approach it on its own terms, instead of the terms of the Christian apologist, we find a rich tapestry of ancient literary techniques which allow us to see how those who wrote about and promoted their faith in this man Jesus did so in an attempt to convince others to join them. Funding for this program was provided in part by the generous contributions of viewers like you via Patreon. Consider joining them at www.patreon.com forward slash Bible Skeptic. Thank you.